topic, so I'll try to be not too uh, scientific. And uh, so let's start. I got to get this message out of my window. Okay. So welcome to Trauma No Realm Lives in the Body, learning how to unwind your somatic anxiety, depression, and suffering. My name is Sergio Campo, as you heard. I am a somatic resolution therapist working in private practice in the financial core of downtown Los Angeles. I am currently a board director of the Somatic Experiencing Institute, where I am an active in fostering research into somatic trauma resolution, as well as in training therapists around the world in resolving the effects of anxiety, depression, PTSD, and the many consequences of trauma. I have lived and worked internationally for many years. I speak four languages, and because of this, I am open to diversity, inclusivity, and the value of our shared humanity. This webinar, as I mentioned, is meant only as a brief overview. I will be speaking about trauma and overwhelm and how it affects our physical and mental well-being. We will cover the steps involving how people become overwhelmed and traumatized and how trauma lives in the body and later affects the mind. We will visit the different types of trauma and how they may affect our health and daily lives. We will also briefly discuss the large spread of anxiety, depression, and general disconnection felt by our society, most possibly caused and created by early life developmental trauma. This webinar, it is a brief introduction to the much larger, more involved subject of trauma and how to unwind its effects in our minds and in our bodies permanently. In the weeks to follow, I will be offering a four-part course delving deeper into the subject I will discuss in more detail exactly how trauma hijacks our bodies and later our minds as it becomes integrated in our larger self. We will learn how exactly it shows up in our behaviors, life choices, life outlook, and how it makes us suffer symptoms which sometimes are truly unbearable. The upcoming four-part life course will reflect the intersection of the science of the body and practical approaches that will be introduced in an easy to, you know, to really understand format my course is going to be open to the lay person and the therapist alike. Whether you are suffering with the symptoms yourself or are a therapist, body worker, yoga instructor, medical professional, coach, or anyone who is helping others, you will walk away with practical tools and resources to begin the work towards healing in a humanistic way. As you join my course, it is really my wish that we become informed in the science and practice of trauma resolution using the body's own healing potential to resolve trauma organically. This course is meant to be an introduction to the humanistic and organic way of using our internal resources, as well the body's wisdom towards healing and well-being. So with that, I would like to begin. I know Ken mentioned our structure. I will do 20 minutes first of a lecture. They will have open time for questions and we'll return to about 50 more minutes and thereafter, I'll open the forum again for more questions. So I will present some slides now. If you be patient with me for one second. Here we are. Sorry about that. So here we begin. Uh, trauma and overwhelm, that's what we're talking about today. Again, I won't get too much into the science of it. There's a lot to it. However, I'll just keep it on the surface and the very important points that we are going to feel in our bodies. So before we begin, what I'd really like to introduce is really we will begin to visit our bodies. And the way I like to do it is to guide you through a small exercise, an experiential exercise to drop into the body. If you will be willing to allow yourself to drop your attention, perhaps away from the monitor, from your electronics, from your surroundings, and allow your eyes to begin to roam. And what I mean by that, allow your eyes to come out from the screen into the room you are sitting in. And just notice the different textures, colors that you may see in the images. Notice the shadows. And just notice how your eyes can be almost like magnets, almost like a child bringing the images in for the first time, allowing yourself the pleasure to be curious of your surroundings. 
And as you do that, also allow yourself and permit yourself to notice the sounds in your room and your surroundings. Perhaps firstly, we will notice the tenor of my voice as I speak to you. Notice also the sounds of perhaps a building you're in, the room you're in, perhaps cars outside, a plane flying by. I'm just being curious of those sounds as you roam, as you, uh, you let your eyes orient. And lastly, notice the body. Notice firstly the weight of your body. Notice how it's being transmitted through your spine, down to your sacrum, onto your sit bones, and then your hips. Notice the weight and how that seat, that bed is cupping you, is holding you away from gravity. And also notice how as you begin to bring your awareness to your hips, then you connect to your legs. Going lastly towards your knees, into your chins, to your ankles, and finally to your feet. And notice your feet. Notice how you notice the ground, perhaps your socks, perhaps your tennis shoes, perhaps the actual carpet you're sitting on, perhaps the bed. And know that that is your ground. And below that ground is the earth. And from the earth comes gravity that's pulling your body towards it, towards its center, which gives it the quality of weight, the quality of, yes, I'm here. And as you allow yourself to notice your weight, notice your temperature. Are you hot, are you cold, are you warm? Is it just right? Can you feel it at all? And as you notice the sights, the sounds, and the body's weight, notice the sensations inside you. Begin to be curious. Maybe ask the question, what do I notice now? Is something tight? Is something loose? Is something too warm? Can I feel anything? Or is there something arriving that's different in you? Is my vision becoming clearer? Is it becoming more open and wide? Am I more inside myself? Do I begin to arrive more? And just allow yourself just one moment to be in the body and notice what's inside before we begin this work. And I'll be silent for a moment as you allow yourself to arrive just a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Okay, if you would gently allow yourself to return, perhaps maybe stretch a little bit, yawn, begin to revive more. And perhaps orienting yourself to the screen that you're in front of. You notice the first slide is trauma and overwhelm. They're two different words, but they're actually the same. And I begin by saying, it lives in our bodies and it speaks to our minds. What is overwhelm? Overwhelm is any life event where we felt out of control, engulfed by fear, even terror. It is an experience where our self-awareness is felt immobile, unable to escape, and perhaps literally frozen. Often, overwhelming experiences become traumatizing experiences when we find ourselves alone, when we are unsupported, when we feel unseen, when we feel ourselves extremely vulnerable. And that's what takes, makes trauma what it is. Those are places where we find ourselves completely alone, almost as, as if we were in a black hole, somewhere where we felt completely abandoned. And here it's an ideal picture of overwhelm. So you see this little baby, this little girl is looking outward. And as she sees something, she has this startle response. And it's really an image of the very onset of overwhelm that we learn as babies because we are wired with it. You can see it in her face, the white eyes, the open mouth, the raised brow. It is a very human response. This is a response to something new and novel, which is perceived as scary. For example, a strange big brown dog walks in and oh my God, what is that thing there? I've never seen it before. Is it gonna eat me? But what if mom arrives, comes into the room and sues her baby and says, oh, it's gonna be okay, sweetie. It's just a neighbor's dog. Her little system will begin to come down from the fright and return once again to play, to being in flow. But what if mom never came in? What if that little baby was left alone with that strange dog? She perhaps gone into extreme fear and perhaps into this profound sense of helplessness 
not able to come down from the fright. So the really trauma and overwhelm are really not on the events, but how it is stored in our nervous system, how it is stored there. We can experience intense events in our lives and not be overwhelmed or traumatized. However, if we experience something overwhelming where we lost control or felt completely alone, our nervous system then stores the experience as something that is incomplete, never finished, still very fresh, and a little bit overwhelming, to say the least. Trauma lives in the body. Whether trauma emerges from a single event or a lifetime of small cumulative injuries, small T trauma, so I'll talk a little bit more about that later, it feels like a straitjacket, which suffocates our attempts to move forward with our lives. It separates us from our own sense of self, from others, and from the world at large. And you can see this man sitting in that canoe by themselves in the ocean. This sense of isolation, of being alone, that, and this experience that is really so foreign to us, and we really can't feel it in our bodies, and that's exactly where it lives. For example, you know, when you feel anxious, don't you first feel it in your belly? Maybe feel, feel a queasiness, a certain constriction. When you feel anxious, usually it's not in your mind that anxiety arises. It arises in your belly, in your chest. And then suddenly you say, oh my God, I don't feel good. So really, this stuff really feels and lives in the body. So what about small T traumas? Small T traumas are mostly relational in nature. In other words, they originate in the interaction with other human beings. The large majority of trauma in this category comes from negative experience with our caregivers and the immediate community. And what that means is as we interact with our caregivers as children, there are always misattunements, small insults, times when they lost their temper or were obviously too busy to pay attention to us. These small occasions are deeply felt in our nervous system as children. And these injuries tend to be wired in the nervous system itself. And I'll say more about that later. And they come into the system as small pieces of something that feels unrepaired. I'll say this again, small pieces of something that feels unrepaired. And it adds up. One can think of these negative experiences as small paper cuts. One paper cut is not a big cause for distress, however, if you receive these small cuts often enough, soon they become very noticeable and we do feel them. Now, our nervous system here soon begins to feel the effect of these small wounds. When they happen at an early age, they really influence the development of the nervous system, creating new pathways that are meant to defend and protect the body from harm. Even though those events might have been uneventful, the charge of these small little events can add up and begin to feel overwhelming over time, most especially into adulthood. Just imagine a seedling as it comes from the ground, say you plant a little tree and you have two seedlings and to one seedling you make a small little cut to the side of the beginning of that seedling. And you'll notice as they grow that the seedling that's been cut has become to really create its own shape and form away from what we expect. That's what happens to our nervous system. And of course, you all heard of the mind and body connection. The memory of overwhelming experiences lives both in the mind as well as in the body. And this applies very much here. One thing I want to say about this also is that, you know, we tend to think that what we, what we are thinking is really what is happening. And I think a lot of times in trauma, that's not true. What's really happening in trauma and overwhelm is that the body is sending stress signals to the brain, telling it that something is just not right here. The brain interprets these sensations in a very primitive way. It automatically interprets the sensations as messages of threat, of not well-being, of something not good. What follows is a cascade of responses that then become strong emotions. This is what we are feeling in anxiety and depression, is these things, these movements in our bodies that are communicating to our brain that something is quite not quite right, not, not where it should be. Memories mislead. Our minds might hold memories populated by images, sounds, 
emotions of past overwhelming events. There may be little or no memories at all as well. So the mind can become very fragmented. The mind works in very separate modules that work together. However, when trauma happens, it interrupts this. So memories become fragmented. However, as you might imagine, the body remembers and never forgets. The body stores overwhelming experiences in which we lost control, lost consciousness, or they happen way too fast. These events are experienced by our emotional nervous system and felt mostly through our autonomous nervous system. So I'm not gonna go into much, too much depth into the science and it can get really complicated and confusing. What I will say is that what this means is that memories in the body remain and we feel these as powerful emotions interpreted by our emotional brain areas. We see the effects in our body through that autonomous nervous system. And here's another slide that might talk more about that. So brief word, the emotional nervous system is a very primitive area. And that's, this is at the core of dysregulation of anxiety, depression, of trauma. It is located at the core of the brain and is one of the most ancient structures. It is responsible for processing and assembling outside experiences, assigning them an emotional charge. What does that mean? Here is where emotions are born. It is an ancient part of our brain that we share with reptiles and other mammals. It is a part of our basic survival system. Here's where automatic reactions to threat originate, most of which we are born with. So imagine you're walking down the sidewalk and you see this shadow on the side of your eye and it's long and it makes a sudden move like it undulates. You will most likely suddenly jump up automatically, automatically. You don't even know what it is and you might orient and look at it and notice that it's, well, it's a hose. It just moved. Somebody's watering the car next door. And you go, ha, huh, it was just a hose. Why do you jump like that? Because in this part of the brain, you have programs. And these programs have patterns that recognize things that are threat threatening. And these patterns in this system come up in trauma over and over again. So, sorry. Well, the heart of the brain, this is more, more stuff you really don't know, need to know. Here's how the emotional brain is composed. You probably heard maybe of the amygdala, hippocampus, hypothalamus, pituitary gland, adrenal glands. They're all involved in the stress responses to trauma, to overwhelm, to stress. These are the areas that are very active in your body as you feel anxiety and depression, as you feel bummed out, as you feel with no energy. These are the places that really, really draw a lot of energy. So what is reacting when we feel anxious or depressed? It is the autonomous nervous system, which is responsible for survival responses of flight, fight, and freeze. When they show up, they can feel very intense, engulfing and overwhelming. And you see in the little figures here, the basic responses, they are always automatic in nature. In other words, we never learn these. They are inborn, they're ancient, and they're time tested. They're all geared to survival. You are born with them. All of us are. So here's where we talk about how overwhelm creeps in. You know, here is almost like the symbol of the heart of emotion being dragged up the hill, which is very much what trauma feels like. Past overwhelming events even disrupt the harmony of the emotional autonomous nervous system, creating a lifelong experience of mental and emotional and bodily challenges. So as this overwhelm comes into the system, it really affects our stress chemistry. That is the chemicals that our body releases when we are stressed. Our physiology becomes adversely affected over time as these chemicals are not meant to be in our body for extended periods of time. What begins to happen is that our bodies become physically challenged by inflammation and a lack of harmony in tissue function. So we begin to notice physical symptoms we get headaches, we get body aches, we get fibromyalgia, we get all these chronic diseases and we just don't know where they're coming from. You know, we go to our doctor, the doctor will tell us, well, it's ge genetic, of course. Well, there's more to that than genetics. Now we talk about unfinished business. In overwhelm, the experience of overwhelming events, basic survival responses automatically arrive, such as running, shielding oneself, pushing away, kicking, 
and hand protective movements that is defending ourselves. The life energy that erupts in overwhelming events can be enormous. It shows up as primal fight, flight, and freeze responses, which get stuck in the body when we are unable to complete the experience. What does this say? This is talking about how in overwhelm, we react with these very primitive responses of fight, flight, and freeze. We share them with all our mammal friends, tigers, elephants, dogs, you name it. In these responses, there's a lot of energy, enormous energy release. It is what we really want to call survival energy. It's the energy that emerges to help us survive overwhelming or very dangerous situations. If we're not able to escape, somehow resolve, or simply we end up losing consciousness, these responses, this life energy gets stuck in the body and then starts showing as the symptoms we come to know as trauma. In the real world, in our world we live every day, what it really looks like is anxiety, anger, depression, PTSD symptoms, and many, many other disorders. So if you open the DSM manual, you'll see trauma everywhere. The body indeed, come, indeed comes to a point where it's carrying unfinished business that it can no longer handle. <laughs> and here you see one of my favorite pictures, this little girl talking about life energy. If you just look at her running away from this big bad peacock and you see the eruption of survival energy that came spontaneously as she noticed this peacock in her backyard and she's running for her life. And literally that's what her body is saying. She's running for her life. And this is a childhood event. And we can also say, well, what if nobody's there for her? What will happen then, as I named before? Well, what if she's writing to mom, which is sitting there saying, honey, it's okay, it's okay. That bird does that all the time. It's just posing. He's a peacock after all. So that's a, a way of focusing on what life energy is, and we all carry this. So now we go to this unfinished business, which is the stuck energy. Trap that is stuck survival energy in the body shows up in the autonomous nervous system. In other words, the autonomous nervous system creates new pathways that perpetuate the unfinished responses of fight, flight, and freeze in the body. This can be spoken of as nervous system dysregulation, or more commonly said, dysregulation. What are we saying? Literally, an overwhelming event can get physically wired into the body. It creates new pathways that carry the same survival responses over and over again. Like that little girl running away, that response, if it's somehow something happens that it becomes incomplete or too overwhelming, they get wired. So we may have had an experience such as a car accident, a fall, where we were not able to avoid the accident so our body gets stuck, still trying to avoid and defend our body from harm, from that car accident, from that fall. It becomes, in fact, an endless loop in the body, sending messages constantly to the brain that this event is not over. You can imagine how much stress this can put on your system over time. It is no wonder we can begin to feel very anxious and frustrated and often not knowing why. This is what we name nervous system dysregulation or simply this dysregulation that lives in us and we have no idea why. Nervous system dysregulation again can also be thought of as a lack of internal har sorry, harmony where the body systems have stopped working in harmony to support life and where dysregulation not only involves the nervous system but also the entire body. In other words, the whole body's hijacked by this. And we, here we can talk about the stress chemicals that are released from your brain areas, from your stomach even, cortisol, adrenaline. These are inflammatory chemicals that they're only meant to be in your bloodstream for very small amounts of time when you're going through stress. However, they're there for hours and days and weeks, months, years, decades. They can begin to do a lot of damage because there are they are really by nature inflammatory and they can cause a variety of conditions. They can create stress patterns in our muscle system. Our muscles can even start holding these very defended poses when our nervous system is too active. It holds the muscles 
almost as if they were defending themselves from that fall, from that crash, or from that physical attack, or whatever happened to us. And these movements can begin to con contradict how we actually walk life. We can be sitting on our chair right now, and we notice our back is stiff, or our legs are numb, or something hurts. And it is that the body is still trying to make these movements inside. And one is trying to override them by sitting straight. And when you start straining the muscles like that, well, we get pain patterns. So this is regulation really lives in the body and can really show up as mannerisms, panic attacks, sudden loss of consciousness, syndromes such as fibromyalgia, sciatica, irritable bowel syndrome, allergies, eczema, hair locks, chronic fatigue, eating disorders, weight loss, weight gain, high blood pressure, diabetes, heart disease, chronic fatigue, cognitive decline, a sense of intrusion, just to name a few. So there's a lot of consequences when trauma actually goes untreated and unrenegotiated. And as you well imagine, dysregulation of the mind is very, very, very prominent. Stuck responses can show up as fear, anxiety, undirected rage, anger, depression, hypervigilance, asocial behavior, withdrawal, repetitive habits, intrusive thoughts, intrusive images, low self-esteem, avoiding behavior, a sense of disconnection from self and others, hyper or hypersexuality, addiction, self-harm, the list goes on. The, 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 the effects can be really intrusive. And here we come to stuckness. So I chose Winnie the Pooh. Going down the rabbit hole. You know, Winnie is Pooh is stuck. He, he doesn't know how he got stuck or even why he got stuck. He just knows he went down this rabbit hole and doesn't know how he got there. His friends can really just pull him as hard as they may, but they cannot get him unstuck. Such a trauma and overwhelm. We know we are there. We do not often know how or even when we got there or how we get out of it. It is a place where we might experience truly something really unspeakable, even something at times unbearable. Such is the nature of trapped overwhelm, of trapped survival energy, of trapped life energy. And with this, I would like to turn the forum for a couple of questions somebody wants to uh, ask. Um, so I'll stop my share here. Okay. Um, I do have a question, Sergio. Um, you talked about trapped survival energy um, and becoming nervous system dysregulation. Oh, how do you go about um, quickly, because I, I bet this is deep, how do we help children with that? for those of us who work with children in schools. <laughs> well, I, I would have to say you, you must come to my course. I can't really go too deeply because the, the, you're speaking of developmental trauma, but it's really about making space of safety for children and allowing all the survival energy to come out in positive ways. And that is through their hobbies, through things they love to do and working with them to actually come in touch more with themselves and their own bodies versus engage so much into cognitive work. When I used to be a school therapist, I used to walk all my kids out to, for, we used to have sessions in this teeny little room. And this little room really allowed nothing of, you know. So I, I would take them outside for walks and I could see their childlike aliveness arrive. And when we do that, there's also a larger connection to themselves. Children can heal especially fast because they have very fungible nervous systems. And because they are that, they can rewire really fast. So the very beginning is to really take them out into the world to engage in, in nature, things like that, they, that can be extremely helpful. And I mean, it's more involved than that. Obviously, developmental trauma can be, as you well imagine, if you have that experience, can be complex. But that's one of the basic things I always do. As this experiential exercise we just did, to let them come into their bodies, to arrive in their bodies. I hope you're, I answer your question in some superficial way. Can you hear me OK, Sergio? I sure can. Um, I have CPTSD and PTSD, and I've had to take charge of my own self-care because 
what you're discussing is incredibly uh, specialized and there are a lot of licensed clinical social workers, psychologists and psychotherapists, and uh, you know what I'm talking about, that this is so out of base for them. And they don't, they do more injury and cause more harm than good sometimes. And I've really had to put my foot up a couple people's rear ends to say the least. Yeah. Um, I have discovered that in everything that you just got done presenting, I've discovered on my own. And I've discovered the um, everything from the um, fibromyalgia, all of the, um, the physical manifestations, um, the interconnectivity of mind to body where the mind is overwhelmed. It chemically uh, cannot handle the toxicity of those chemicals and it attacks the body physically. I have felt all these manifestations. Mm -hmm. And I've been discovering through the readings of Norman Doige with um, how the mind heals itself from trauma. And I've also had brain, I've had a um, brain injury with, um, I had a, um, I was unconscious once, but I understand the correlation of PTSD and the physiological rearrangements and the neuro pathways. I understand all of these things. And what I'm discovering is that with children development with our previous question and even as myself as an adult the greatest method of self-healing comes always in activity and in music kinesthetics um physical exercise music movement it's it helps the body release what's in itself um i started running literally eight days ago Good. And since I, and in eight days, I've ran six times and I've worked myself up to one mile and one mile first two runs. And the last three runs were two miles each. And the amount of energy and the, um, and the, and the kick off of this, this is my ex personal experience of combating what's going on in my body where it, I am so out of control of what's going on in my body that for a child when we have activity, it releases, it, it resets the mind. There's at least three hormones in the body that are, uh, are positives that help um, counteract the negatives. And I've been studying also neurology. And in neurology, yeah. it's so amazing gonna, what can, you do. I mean, can, like... Can I pause for yeah. a moment? Yes, yes. I mean, yeah, like... We, can, those, we, have lim we have limited time. Yeah. So do you have a question? Yeah, so would for the children and for myself, don't you think that the biggest answer and cure is going to come from the physical activity um, in form of yoga, um, mindfulness, um, music, and, and the study of uh, and, um, neuroplasticity? Um, and, and, and what you've done in connecting the dots, but do you, I think, don't you think the cure is going to be between the psychotherapy of talk with children to understand their emotions, but also in processing it out of their body physically so, through exercise. So can I answer that question? Yes. So um, the work I do, I'm, I, I practice somatic experiencing. And what we actually do is exactly that. We unwind and we actually renegotiate trauma permanently from the body. And, it, and all the things you named are very positive ways to actually allow people to become more embodied. Those in and of themselves will not re-regulate trauma. They help. They become things you can do and to work and to really release energy. However, the system is a wiring the system that we do through a different process of slowing the body down. So we really don't have the time in this forum to really go through all those pieces. Okay. I would encourage you to come, you know, and, and do some um, some of the co coursework and further for your education, somatic experiencing to really begin to touch into how we do this work, which you know it's a huge subject and there's no way we can. You know, I, I really welcome your questions and I'm so sorry that the things that happened to your life happened to you it's and okay. how you are suffering. Well, it's yes and not. And I'm so yeah. sorry to see that, you know, you are doing your best and you discovered things for yourself that have worked for you. And I'm so happy to see that you're a pathway where you're going really through the process of healing. And it's wonderful to see, to see this determination and this, this want to heal. And I, I really, I know, really honor that. Enough. I, you, you and I both know, but what I'm doing on my own is not enough. And that's where the suffering lies. And that's so frustrating because the information is so exclusive and so um, well kept. And there's, mil there's, thousands, there's millions of people like us, you know this. And um, it, there's no national system or program designed to help us, which is why I want, I'm here. 
I want that yeah. national program. I want groups well, for everybody. I, I would say uh, reach out to me via my personal communication that may I can refer you to folks that That's can work terrific. with you. Um, we have a lineup of questions that are coming through the chat with all 80 of us hoping to have um, uh, some some moment, I suppose. I'm done. So one of the first questions that's come up, um, Serge, in, in response to where Sonia was going, what if you are physically unable to um, to exercise, to run, to move? Can you think of a short or um, um, recommended um, trauma release for someone who doesn't have the physicality? Well, um, I mean, we can go through different levels. I mean, one of the things that really works well, if you're really, again, orienting yourself out into your room, try to go outside and really begin to notice the details of the world around you. Really notice the sounds and count five sounds and name them out. Count five sensations in the body and name them out with your words. And count and really perceive five things and count them out. Another thing you can do is do a self-hug. A hug where you place your hand on your heart here and then you embrace yourself and really squeeze the muscles of your arm and feel the heart and just notice how the body receives this containment this way of holding yourself and holding the body yeah again there's several exercises that i can teach you that you know i will be offering those in one of the modules so i'll do four modules of course, I'll discuss more, but I'll really give some interventions for you guys to use for yourselves personally. Shannon adds also that breath. Um, yeah, yes. Is, is a, you know, wow, I'm so glad to hear that. Um, Shannon has also shared with us um, her interest in dance movement therapy and yeah. um, is anxious for us all to think about that as another um, a lifelong yeah. um, trauma release perhaps. Are these modules free? Uh, they're not. It's a $199 four-week program. We'll be sending that information um, to all of you. If you're curious about the workshop that Sergio is doing with um, the Center for Continuing Education, but we'll also send you resources um, for uh, other areas and programs uh, as well. I'll try and send a detailed follow-up note uh, to everyone with, with Sergio's advice. Um, when we've completed. And that'll probably happen on Monday. <laughs> can we take a purchase order? We sure can, and we can do organizational and, and um, employment, employer purchase orders. But um, again, feel free. I, I posted my email once and I will again, uh, any details like this around continuing education, I welcome hearing from you. A question. Um, yes. It sounds like we, you know, we talked a lot about um, just like trauma and overwhelm and the impact in the brain and kind of the, the aftermath really um, of what happens with that, like trapped energy that continuing to to impact us. Um, so when these events are actually happening, is there anything um, that you can do to prevent that kind of like trapped energy while you're going through that traumatic event? And I'm thinking about something like car accident, something like that. Anything yeah. in the moment that can help to prevent this trapped energy l later on, like something in that moment? Absolutely. And actually, the second part, I'm going to talk exactly about that. So I'll mention you. Okay. Awesome. There's something very, you know, yes, absolutely. There is. Awesome. Um, I'm also going to share a, in the content that we forward after that our Santa Barbara campus, thank you, Elizabeth, does have uh, a professional certificate in, in somatic therapy. So beyond the, um, the, the small four week continuing education program that Sergio is bringing to the Center for Continuing Education. Uh, any of you in, in, in the professional fields might very much want to look into and consider. Mm -hmm. We'll send those links, um, the certificate program out of Santa Barbara. Sergio, are you familiar with spatial dynamics? Jaman McMillan? Mm, not quite. following 
some of the chats. Um, kids returning to school, we don't necessarily know how much trauma they're experiencing. Um, can you share some ideas to support students? I didn't hear the first part of the question. Support students in exactly... Um... Um, in, in the, uh, the, the current oh. uh, modern trauma of, of, um, the, of returning to school or homeschooling and... And, um, the and going back to school? Abnormal circumstances with which kids are being asked to learn. Well, it is very abnormal because, you know, kids are going through the social engagement piece of their development. And when that's precluded from you, there's also, again, I'm going to talk about in, in, in this next little module I'm going to do after we're done with questions about how children don't have an outlet. There's no outlet whatsoever to be able to cope with being at home all the time. Children are meant to explore. They're meant to interact socially. They're meant to be together. And when you're sitting in front of a screen, that really begins to act upon the nervous system in the way that this charge just builds up every single day. And of course, every parent knows that that charge is always going to be there. And being in this environment is really, like many of you were mentioning, exercise, allow, you know, this life energy to really carry itself through, to do activities, do something to really move the body because kids if especially need to move their bodies. And I will say that would be the number th one thing to get them on some kind of exercise program, whether it be playing or swimming, anything. Otherwise, that just sits in the body and God knows where it wants to go. Our last note in chat, Sergio, says that, uh, that folks are eager to hear the second part of this presentation right. or your next <laughs> brief right. module and, and being mindful of time. Okay, so um, let me go to the next that. module. It'll be about 50 more minutes or so. Tell me if you need me to speed it up, Ken, over the, over the process. I have no time constraints. And, and, All right. Um, so I'm sure folks me, will stay as long as they can. Okay. All right. If you guys are ready, let me, uh, let me go back to my things here. Uh -huh. So here we are. Back to good old weenie. Seldom do we encounter a traumatized animal in the wild. Why is that? So here you see this wonderful koalas in nature enjoying this eucalyptus leaf. And you know, animals go through very, very, very tough circumstances. They are predated upon, there's disease, there's harm, there's falls, and seldom you will see any traumatized animals in the wild. And I'm talking the wild, not domesticated. So going back to the car accident um, question, this is very much related. Stress is released, discharge instinctively. Animals are able to discharge the intensity of overwhelming events quickly, just moments after encounters where their body experiences strong survival responses of fight and flight. These mechanisms are innate. In other words, they appear spontaneously and are automatic when overwhelm needs to be discharged. So you see this horse bucking. Horses will buck when they're excited. Horses will buck after when they're scared. It's an automatic reaction. All mammals have it, all reptiles have this, and we do too. You might be wondering, how is overwhelm discharged in animals? You might already figure it out. Stress is discharged instinctively Animals will instinctively allow their bodies to tremor, shake, shiver, make spontaneous repetitive movements such as kicking, jumping, pushing. These spontaneous movements serve to drain the neural nervous system activation energy through the muscular system. So in other words, we can think of discharging as really this cleansing of the nervous system, almost like a washing machine, where there's too much energy, too much survival response, and suddenly, how do you release it? The muscles start doing it. And all the impulses of the nervous system go through the muscles and begin releasing heat. And that's how this charge is discharged. And to go back to the question of Bridget, Bridget asked, what happens after an accident? And here I am sitting and, and you know, your body, what it wants to do next, it wants to shake. It wants to shiver, it wants to tremor. Unfortunately, when accidents happen and the ambulance gets there and paramedics, when you start tremoring, they'll, they'll actually strap you down and tell you not to do that or they'll inject you so that you don't convulse. Actually, we need to convulse 
because that's how we're going to release the fright, the charge of that accident. And this is how animals do it. This is why in the wild, you'll never see an animal who's traumatized. So why don't, don't human beings do this? We have this instinct, don't we? Humans have the same inherent mechanism to automatically discharge. However, our big brains tend to override mechanisms. Why? Our rational minds tend to lead with restraint. There is a social component where we inhibit impulses in our body discharge. We often feel that if we let our body spontaneously discharge, that is shake, we might be seen as defective, as weird. And here's where shame enters a picture. Can you imagine if you fall and then you get up and you start shaking, people are gonna think I'm crazy. And that's why people don't do that. They repress their rational minds, their big brain. Not our old brain, not our mammalian brain, but our old brain that we have here that just tells us not to do that and overrides those instincts that we have to really do this. And shame, by the way, is I think the most important component and why we get traumatized to begin with. Discharging in shame. In fact, shame and shaming plays a large role in the old realm to be fixated in the body. We don't, I'm sorry, I can't, um, having an issue here. We do not allow the natural mechanism to discharge over realm immediately. This survival energy becomes trapped in the body. So what we're saying here is that if we don't allow this natural mechanism that we have in our system, this automatic instinctual mechanism, and we override it with shame, then that energy, that survival energy, that big charge gets stuck in your body. And it becomes this endless loop that just keeps going and going until it's finally released. Trap survival energy is disorganized. It goes against the everyday function. It thinks the event is still happening. Though we might be sitting at a dinner table, our body might still be running as if under attack or being subjected to something unbearable. So as we're sitting or we're resting or we're walking down the street, our bodies might still be in that car accident, still be in that attack, still be in that place of abuse, be in that place where something bad happened to us. And the body doesn't know any different. It doesn't know that the event is over. It just keeps going and going. Trap survival energy. So again, this topic affects our emotional system, which leads to an overactive hormonal state with the release of stress chemicals, which can continue through a lifetime. This in turn affects us mentally, emotionally, and physically, potentially resulting in serious health challenges. The same stress chemicals secreted during an overwhelming experience or event continue to be secreted without lessening, sometimes over a lifetime. Like the image you see here, it's like a dense sun that shoots magma through the surface. It is dense, it's very active, and it keeps on giving. It's just a gift that just keeps on giving, giving it to you, really, for a long time to come. Remembering. Overwhelming events or long-term difficult experiences sometimes are forgotten in our minds, especially if these took place in infancy or where we suddenly lost consciousness. For this reason, some of us have real, real challenges and cannot figure out why we feel the way we do. So we can't rely on our mind to remember anything, really. And especially we had an event where we lost consciousness you know, the, the process in the body kept on going on even though our consciousness was lost. Remembering again, there are many classes of trauma in our room which we might, sorry, uh, sorry about that. There's many classes of trauma in our room where we might have no memories. To name a few, we can mention pre and perinatal trauma, surgical procedures, high fevers, near drownings, falls, auto accidents, high impacts, poisoning, early life physical and sexual abuse, etc. There's a lot to name here. And some of these classes of trauma, there's just no, no memories at all. Or they're fragmented memories or partial memories or memories of the body. So going back to small T traumas, and this is a big piece of uh, 
how we, we come to really understand that how what happens to us as little kids really matters. The cumulative weight of small T traumas as negative experiences can really overwhelm our nervous system to the same extent as if, as if we had these experiences as a really significant traumatic event. When these small T traumas happen in crucial developmental years of our lives, the potential for overwhelm is significant. A child can and often does gradually begin to show signs of overwhelm in their system. Their memories can be foggy or not present at all. So you see how I space that out, how everything slows down to this fog. And as we as children become adults and we begin to experience the world as adults, we begin to see how it really affects us. And one thing I wanna say about this as well is that little kids have big emotions. Unlike us as adults, you know, every small wound that a child feels is big emotionally and these really add up. You know, for example, take a little kid that lost their mom at the store and they're crying in the middle of the store and people are coming up to what's wrong. But can you imagine an adult in the middle of a store crying and screaming like that? I think soon they will call the psychiatric unit. Those emotions are big. So this is the intensity of the small wounds when they're left unattended. These small little wounds, these small little events are big emotions. And no wonder they add up and how they feel so big when we are adults. An insidious presence. Early life overwhelm that we also know as developmental trauma can be difficult to pinpoint as the conscious memories are mostly early in life. However, the symptoms can be prominent ranging from anxiety, depression, to life constricting personality disorders and also physical ailments. Those big emotions become stuck in the body and because children can't escape, you know, they can't leave the house and say one day, hey, mom, dad, I'm packing up and moving to Hawaii. And they can't fight back, you know, it's impossible. Parents are gigantic beings. So what do children do? Children collapse and their nervous system collapses with them, but the charge is just there under this lid. And this collapse can last for the rest of our lives. We can, you know, feel foggy and disconnected forever. And that stuff is still underneath, it's still lurking underneath. It is an insidious presence. Developmental trauma is more widespread than we might think in modern society. The large increase of mental health issues over the last few years, last decades, point to early life difficulty that perhaps can be closely linked to early life overwhelm and small T traumas. So these small T traumas really add up. So we're coming to this point, which is extremely complex, but not really, it's actually really easy. But to explain it only a couple of minutes is quite a challenge and I'll do my best just to give you a sense of it. The process is really to begin to get in touch with our felt sense experience in our bodies. The, scientifically, we call that interoceptions. Simply put, it's about bringing an awareness of what is happening or not internally in the form of sensations, emotions, images, meaning making and movements. You know that experiential exercise I led you through in the beginning? Perhaps you felt some of that. Perhaps as you went inwards and you noticed what was there, what wasn't there, if you begin to notice what began to come up, maybe emotions, maybe a sense of well-being, maybe a sense of here at the right time at the right place to listen to this stuff. Or maybe you felt, no, I, I just, I'm just frustrated. I don't, I, don't, I don't want to have anything to do with this guy. Who does he know? Who is this guy? All that stuff can be coming up. That's the felt sense experience. The messages our bodies are sending us every day, really telling us in this very unspoken language of the body where everything that ever happened to us is always present. When we slow it down and begin to really drop into ourselves, that is when we begin to really sense those sensations our internal environment, do we really begin to get in touch with the source of what really ails us, what's really here inside us? So going on with how to unwind. When we connect to our body sensations through our awareness, we are able to have an experience of how we are receiving the world. And most importantly, 
what our bodies are truly experiencing and wanting to complete. And this is really naming that as we tap into our body, we can begin to really touch with the fear, the frustration, and that traps survival energy within. So what we're attempting to do is not accelerate it, but to really slow it down and take it piece by piece by piece. In my work, we work with just small slices at a time. So imagine you have a mountain of all this charge and activation, like this mound. Every time you do a session, you just slice a little bit off that mountain and you'll notice it becomes less high, less high, less high. And what remains above that little mound or that mound is more space. And that spaciousness is the more life energy you will feel, the more you you will become, the more of a person you are, the person you were born to be. So we really slice small pieces to the question from Sonia who asked me about how do we do this? It's not really about exploding with energy. It's really about working in this therapeutic environment where we actually take small piece at a time, slice it off, let it integrate and come back. And you know, it's more involved than that, but in very simple terms, that's how I would like to explain it. And this really always happens in a place of safety. Well, we actually experience how our body memories are really arriving in the body and how an internal mechanism begins to arrive. What, this is really the crux of the work. This is the most important place, spot that I want to really focus on. And this is where in future classes we will talk about. This is what I call our emotional immune system. That is when we're in a safe place, and we make what's here, what the charge, whatever we're feeling just manageable enough, this immune system is big enough, just big enough to grab a piece of that and reorganize it, rewire it. So we're not looking to reorganize the trauma in one sitting, but small pieces. Because the reason we get dysregulated, we get traumatized to begin with, it's of course we're alone, but why does it get stuck? It gets stuck because this immune system is not able to heal it. It's too big, it's too much and they can only do small pieces at a time. You know, like that little girl running away from the peacock. Well, that's a big piece already. Mom, if she's there, has to settle her for maybe 10, 15 minutes in that moment. And then it's just enough for her to feel safe enough to be like, oh, for her little nervous system and go like, okay, it's fine. And that's when that immune system comes out to play and goes, okay, we're not gonna go down that pathway of constant fear. We're gonna say, we survived, it's okay. And now I'm more resilient. Now I know about peacocks and I know not to get, you know, really, really too close to them or really that they're not that harmful. They're just peacocking because that's what they do. They peacock. So we come to this piece. Somatic work and what I do, somatic experiencing, works by bringing really small measured portions of emotional difficulty in tandem with safety. That is, you know, safety and risk together this allows the body to begin to rewire or reharmonize what feels chaotic and constrictive. It's really a physiological process of the nervous system wiring towards a different, and not so much in the brain, but in the body itself, these pathways of fight flight responses, which are causing symptoms, which are causing emotions. That's what we're working with. You know, in psychotherapy, we work with the meaning piece of mind, like what it means for me. What was it like to me to have this dad that I had, this mom? And we make meaning and we can really get really far with that. However, when you're charged, when you're feeling this, these symptoms, that requires really dropping into the body. And we come to the end of this presentation. I just wanna say um, a better world is possible. Trauma has invaded, especially in modern society. So many of us affect us, affect us so many of us so deeply without knowing what's happening to us, without knowing where we're going with that, feeling this overwhelm, this sense of loss, this sense of abandonment, of sadness, of frustration, of depression, of anxiety, always looking for solutions with drugs, with this, with that, and nothing coming to fruition. And the answer is within ourselves and this work and this wonderful work that I partake in, to which I'm so honored to be a part of and not only as a therapist, but also being part of Somatic Experiencing Institute, teaching other therapists how to do this work and furthering the work in research. We're really actively working to bring more research online to make this an accepted best practice in all instances. So I really thank you so much for participating, for your attention, for 
bearing with me sometimes with my clumsy technological limitations. You know, this is my first time doing any uh, any webinars with uh, with slides like this. So, with that, I would like to. Let me see. What am I trying to do here? I'm trying to stop the share. And now we are going to go to questions. If we have time for questions. This is uh, a really hard question. Um, it's hitting right on what you're talking about. And I'm sorry I'm jumping back into this. And I have the question written down. What I struggle with in executive functioning and talking about rebuilding and rewiring our circuitry, basically, um, reharmonizing um, and looking at neuroplasticity on the side, people here. I'm, I'm looking at the mind. When you look at all of these things, we have to rebuild it's like a building block system. So my question to you is, is there a system designed to streamline like block by block a proven system of an order of integration that really helps streamline recovery and rebuilding our lives for someone like me. Um, when I look at neuroplasticity, there's all these, they say that every person, it, sure. the recovery is so um, customary that some things work better for others versus other people. Yeah, and so my question to you is for that, yeah. Can I ask to answer that question? Please. So, very simply, I will say that everybody's different and, right. that every single, and that every single nervous system is different and that everything that one does for oneself that works on the outside is always helpful. The base is really to do somatic work and to begin to discharge the activation within the body. And as that begins to happen, how would I describe this? It's, it's very simply, it's that as you arrive in, in sessions, you have all this, you're carrying all this weight, all this charge. And as it begins to reduce and come down, then a new person begins to arrive every single week that needs different things. That now doesn't really want to run anymore. They want to read more. Now they don't want to really engage in dating. They want to really meditate more. So it's a very organic, this is why I kept naming that word organic. It's an organic process that's really germane to each person. And I, as a therapist, am following, I'm not leading, I'm coming along with, I'm supporting, I'm allowing, and I'm wanting and desiring for healing to arrive. So there is no, no answer to your question specifically. However, I would say that whatever resources you are using now, use them. And over time, they might become not usable anymore. I have patients that have suffered with thyroid issues that after a while, they start getting symptoms because the thyroid medication is doing things to them because they don't need it anymore. Because the nervous system has healed and the stress chemicals are not there anymore and the tissues have healed. So thyroid is back to normal. So it always shifts, there's no, there's no set, so it's very organic. Yeah. We have a couple of people in queue, Sergio, um, okay. with questions. Does someone want to, um, to speak up with a, another question for Serge while we're still here? Um, I found it really interesting what you had to say, uh, said here about um, letting, like how animals in the wild do not have any trauma. I found that so interesting. And I think it's so true. One of the questions I had during the earlier one was like, I wonder if there's any societal influence on our trauma. And um, you kind of answered that when we override our natural instincts. So I'm thinking like, um, that would be challenging. Like if I was in some sort of like, a traumatic event and I'm like and I feel a sense to like shake or something I could feel that shame and embarrassment um so um for people who I'm thinking about people who've gone through like relational trauma is one of the things we would encourage them like if you feel angry like let it out like in that moment if you feel like um like you feel so much anger, you need to scream, punch things, like do it. Like, is that part of like the letting whatever automatic responses that need to come out? Is that part of that? It is, but not in that way. That's what you name screaming is explosive. And okay. explosive, all it does is just dis discharge is physiological, physical energy 
but not that charge. And what it does, it just comes, builds up again and comes out again and again and again and again. It really, I mean, I'll talk about that more in the courses that we really feel into them, sense into them, and allow them to gradually begin to do what they want to do. And for some people, it's going to look like pushing. Some people like trembling. Some people like really dissociating. Everybody's different. And you named, uh, you know, generational issues, societal issues. Those are also highly influential in how trauma becomes really installed in people. Immigration is a big piece. Transgenerational trauma, that is what we epigenetically carry from our, from our elders. All that comes together. It all comes together to really form this archetypal, this, this piece for all of us, depending on where we come from. I hope that answers your question in some way. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I yeah. have a question that's hard. How do you overcome anxiety? Oh. Uh, that Sonia, Sonia, do, do, uh, we would like to have other people also okay. ask questions. I'm sorry. Yes, okay. Ken, do we have any uh, other questions there? Um, I, one question here from Dana about recommended tools. And I guess I'm going to answer that by saying uh, I will uh, convene and, and debrief with Sergio after and we'll prepare uh, a bibliography of resources and tools and, and um, some of Sergio's recommended um, mm -hmm. resources. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Uh, um, Sharon, thank you. She's asking again, are there any tools or educational materials that you off the top of your head will recommend um, that might, let, let me read this. Um, for clinicians working with undocumented folks who may be doing intense physical labor and also have different traumatic experiences, I'm thinking about this work and how can it and how hard it uh, it is to get access material, mental health services for low income folks. Uh, what tools could clinicians have that they could use uh, for brief uh, encounters? And I, I think specifically this question is crisis intervention with somatic trauma. Uh, I mean, I can offer, I am, I think in my first module, I'm going to talk about that, which is uh, emotional aid. So, I mean, I don't think we have time now to go into that, but there's ways to actually immediately intercede after a disaster, after something overwhelming happens to allow the nervous system to calm down in the moment. So I'm definitely can talk about that in the beginning. So I was thinking of leaving that for the fourth module, but I might include it for the first one because it's so important. A lot of people ask about that. And thank you for that question. Can you summarize somatic experiences? I'm not sure if I have a good grasp on this. Bridget, I think that maybe um, the opportunity to review the slides or, or to review the recording might really help clarify um, that okay, for okay. you, and I, I'll offer that. Uh, and just briefly, I can answer that. Just somatic experiencing is really what it says. It's a somatic experience. In other words, we are really beginning to tap into our internal spots, our internal experience, slowing that experience down. And then as I named, taking one small piece of that experience and allowing it to be in a place of safety and eventually our own immune system will re-regulate automatically. That is the amazing process of healing that our body contains. You know, our ancestors were not as traumatized as we were. We must wonder why. Because, you know, we're prey animals. And we lived in places where we're surrounded by very, 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 very difficult situations. And we survived amazing, enormous challenges, freezes, heat, disasters, and here we are. And our ancestors were nowhere near as traumatized as we are. So you got to wonder how that happened. So thus, and my belief in somatic work and the work that I do. So I hope that answered the question in some cursory way. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's, it, it goes deep. It does go deep. And there have been some questions about um, our intention for the Center uh, for Continuing Education offering that Sergio is, is um, presenting this fall. It is not specifically geared, just like this afternoon's conversation was not, uh, to clinicians specifically. So yes, those of you teaching poetry to teens will benefit from a broader understanding of, um, 
of, of trauma and overwhelm through Sergio's um, lens. And it is our intention with all of our lifelong er learning offerings that, um, that they are open to everyone, first of all, and um, that they are, um, that the, the curriculum is driven for lifelong learners, for, for all people. We will present more specialized uh, certificates and CEU offerings. Again, the certificate program in Santa Barbara uh, is probably, um, is very, very well known and, and very valuable if you're a clinician, uh, if you're a postgraduate um, practicing therapist. But we hope to keep our programming um, open to everyone so that parents can maybe gain some one-on-one uh, -on -one insights so that we can all include the understanding and the, and the awareness of our body in our day-to-day -day, um, experiences and traumas. Uh, I feel a little more prepared to maybe stub my toe or, <laughs> <laughs> or burn uh, my hand in the oven uh, later today, which I do every time I bake. Um, but I'm, I'm feeling um, a, a sense of... Um, a little bit of an understanding about how my entire brain and body have so much uh, to learn from my breathing and my sense of peace. And, and there's Uncle Kenny's summary. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> um, this has been an, a valuable and very brief bit of time together, but I hope you've enjoyed Sergio's insights. I'm impressed with his research, but remember, I was his research librarian. <laughs> Sergio, thank you so much. Do you have a final note? I do. So I really would like to thank you for participating and for your very, very kind attention. You know, if any of you have any further questions, you can reach me via my website at sergiocampo.com, where you'll find some of my writings as well as information on my private practice on how to get directly in touch with me. I also offer case consults to therapists on trauma resolution and somatic psychology interventions. I really, really hope you will join me on this journey in the next few weeks as enrollment for this course has begun. Enrollment will be limited, Ken tells me, so make sure to register soon. I promise it will be both fulfilling and eye-opening. I really look forward to seeing you all there. Thank you for your kind attention, and I hope you have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you, Sergio. Thank you. You are amazing. Thank you. Looking forward to knowing you better. Gracias. Hasta luego. Thank Bye. you. Bye.